Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Steve Forbes, editor-in-chief of Forbes Media, my boss. Steve, good to see you. Good to see you, Diane. So talking, let's start with Israel. Um, obviously, the, the tension has now shifted to the response to this horrific terrorist attack. What are you thinking about in terms of the wider implications? Well, I think uh, what it underscores is, is that there's evil in the world. And there's a tendency to comp compartmentalize everything. Ukraine, mm -hmm. Middle East, Taiwan. They're all gathered, not gathered together, but they're all linked together. Mm -hmm. And the influence of one, the outcome of one, how events unfold in one have a huge impact on others. So in the Middle East, they're going to take out Hamas. And the, their taking of hostages was precisely what they wanted to do to avoid an attack. I'm sure the Israelis, one of the reasons why we haven't had the big attack yet, is they already sent, have sent teams in there mm -hmm. trying to figure out where they are, what the, could be done to rescue them. So uh, that, uh, that part of the story is still unfolding. But they are going to take out Hamas. That leads to the question, what are they going to do after they occupy Gaza? Well, what they're not going to do is make the mistake they made after 2005, left it to its own device and allowed Iran to move in and put in this terrorist organization in charge. Yeah. And right now the focus should be, which is already unfolding as we speak, is to have Egypt set up special camps to take in refugees. Well, so that means one of the questions that's been dominating a lot of the headlines is what does Gaza look like without Hamas, given how much it's been embedded? It's an unusual terrorist organization. It's run hospitals. It's run schools. You know, the humanitarian crisis there that's getting a lot of attention, how does that resolve itself in a way that um, is, you know, what Israel intends, which is its own protection? Well, I think uh, Hamas is also... You know, what the, the, the hospitals and things like that are much like uh, gangsters in uh, cities in the U.S. giving turkeys out at Thanksgiving. Oh, we're not such bad people. But they are. They make sure civilians sure. are going to be in the way of uh, incoming missiles. It's like the mafia. They make, yes. They, they, they make sure that uh, there's going to be real damage that can be photographed to try to get uh, global opinion to put pressure on Israel. So in terms of uh, the f uh, embedding um, uh, Hamas, that's precisely why the Israelis are going to go in. Precisely they know pretty much who's who and take them out. And then uh, they're going to have to work with Egypt and others on how this territory is administered. People forget that Egypt uh, took uh, the Gaza Strip after the late 40s, the mm -hmm. war of original war of independence for Israel, occupied it till the 67 war. Uh, Israel decided after a few decades uh, they didn't want this thing, and they tried to set up an independent Palestinian state, and they saw what happened. The bad guys were allowed to move in. So that, uh, that's not, they're going to try to minimize the huge human costs, but also we should not mistake that this is a small, powerful, well-financed group of terrorists, evil. We saw what they did deliberately in Israel. And so they do have to be taken out. Now, what is Iran going to do? Is Iran going to try to open up another front mm. uh, with the West Bank uh, or with and Lebanon? Hezbollah. Uh, with Hezbollah. And uh, the answer there is I think the Israelis are now going to give very serious consideration to going against Iran's nuclear facilities. Which is very hard to do alone, of course. So that gets to the U.S. response. I mean, there was there, two weeks ago we were talking about the dawn of a, a new era of prosperity and peace in the region, you know, because of the ties that have already been created with the Abraham Accords, potential ties with Saudi Arabia. Um, how much can Israel, how much agency does it have right now to deal with Iran without jeopardizing some of those regional ties? It depends on how bad the humanitarian crisis becomes. I think every they're going out of their way to show they're doing everything they can. And having Hamas killing their own people who are trying to flee to the south, I think uh, is going to be having an impact. So in terms of uh, the Abraham Accords, they go on the sidelines for the moment. But make no mistake, behind the scenes, governments in Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, want Hamas eradicated. Uh, they can't say it publicly, but that's what they want. They see it as a threat to them. What, what, 
is to be done about Iran? That's almost an existential question and one that can't be resolved in this conversation. But um, it clearly has a role in this conflict. Um, how has the U.S. been engaging with Iran? Do you think we have to shift our policy now with regard to it? We've, uh, f over 40 years, uh, we've made huge mistakes with Iran, thinking that with the right carrots and a few sticks, they can be made to behave themselves. Failed every single time. The Israelis, I know, in around 2010, 2012, gave very serious consideration to taking out those nuclear facilities. They knew what they're aimed at. And people will say, oh, they would never use them against Israel. Well, there are fanatics who would uh, consider something like that. We got a little uh, bloody taste of it, what happened on October 7th. Uh, people will do things seemingly damaging themselves in terms of their economy or their infrastructure. Uh, they think they have higher goals than uh, mere material things like that. What stopped them back in 2012? U.S. pressure. Hmm. Uh, we, for our own reasons, thought we could do something to modify Iran. Uh, we recognize uh, there could have unforeseen repercussions. There always is a, with a major military operation. So more than once. We put huge pressure on the Israeli government not to do it, and they backed off. Well, we saw from the 1990s when North Korea was on the cusp of becoming a, uh, developing, a new, developing a nuclear device, where that led, if you don't nip it in the bud. Mm -hmm. So this should have been done 10, 12, 14 years ago, uh, that, that operation. Uh, after all, uh, Israel did it uh, in uh, 1980 against uh, uh, Iran and uh, uh, against, excuse me against Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, they did it when Syria had ambitions uh, in the mid uh, early 2000s, and they took out that facility. So this wasn't something new. Obviously, the scope of it would be enormous, but the uh, sending the message: you want to develop a weapon, forget about it. We know what you're doing. We'll take it out. Now, in terms of the difficulty. Uh, the question has always been, could Israel do it alone? I think the point has come now where the Israelis are going to decide maybe we have to try it alone, at least cripple the thing, and uh, also maybe take out some of Iran's, uh, as an adjunct, mm -hmm. uh, some of their uh, oil production facilities, some of their refineries. Uh, not the oil production itself, but Iran needs uh, sells uh, so oil products. This could become a regional war? That's one of this the is, big... This is already, in a, in a sense, a regional war. Mm -hmm. It just depends what intensity it reaches. Hamas would not have done what they did without a green light from uh, Tehran. Mm -hmm. Just as North Korea did not invade South Korea back in 1950, June of 1950, without the green light from the Kremlin. So the U.S., I mean, the Biden administration has been very supportive so far. Um, Trump administration had been supportive. We'll leave that separately right now. But um, is there an appetite to support Israel for a direct attack on Iran? I mean, no. maybe it's hard to say. So what, what do we no. do in that uh, scenario? In fact, one of the peculiarities of this administration is, despite Iran's history, they still think they could revive some sort of nuclear agreement some way to kick the can down the road, so to speak, even mm -hmm. though it's a nuclear. And uh, so we had that 2015 abomination. Trump was right to uh, undo that. But also, though, even now, until very recently, up to now, they're trying to find ways of putting out carrots. And so even though they didn't formally relax, uh, undo the sanctions, look at what happened. Biden comes into office, Iran's exporting 200,000 barrels of oil a day. Today it's one and a half million. No punishment. Mm -hmm. And they thought, oh, make Iran rich, and they, they, they'll, they'll come to their senses. No, all it did was give them the wherewithal to do bad things. So let's look at what is on your radar for what's next at this point. There's obviously, you know, the situation in Gaza is not going to be resolved anytime soon. Um, what are you looking for? Let's, let's switch a little bit to U.S. politics for a second. The rhetoric that you're hearing from the GOP candidates about the threats, you mentioned that these threats in the Middle East are tied to threats in Ukraine, North Korea, China's obviously a concern. When you look at the foreign policy of the U.S. that's being articulated 
by the Republicans. Does that give you hope that we're moving in the right direction? Well, saying Republicans or Democrats these days, you have to say which part of it. True uh, enough. They're, 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 <laughs> and and it, we, it's we not, it's certainly know you, what you, side you, you were on when you, you came you, to the... You, you, you're, there's no unity there. Yeah. And one of the things that has to be, uh, I think, resisted, and I think is by some of the candidates, this trend towards uh, isolationism or uh, uh, the moral equivalency on the far left of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And to realize that there are very real threats out there. The question is, what is the most effective way to deal with it? Again, the Biden administration sort of moves in the right direction, but then can't realize the full implications of what needs to be done. You saw it with Ukraine. Once it became clear Ukraine was not going to be overrun in a few days, uh, the weapons should have been poured in. But everything, uh, the U.S. has dragged its feet on every major weapon systems uh, that Ukraine has needed. They're still waiting for F-16s. They'll get to, eventually. Abrams tanks, we have thousands of them. How many of them are in uh, Ukraine? Zippo, mm. maybe they'll get a few soon. And uh, on and on it goes, uh, HIMARS and everything else. So if they'd given the proper weaponry at the beginning, uh, Ukraine probably could have won this war. So in terms of the Middle East with, uh, with Israel, good they're backing Israel now, making sure that the world knows we are keenly interested, sending uh, mm -hmm. uh, carrier fleets over there. But when the crunch time comes, what do you do about Iran? Is this administration going to uh, pull back, as they've always done, and hope that uh, maybe they'll come to their senses? No, they won't. And I think that'll be an issue in 2024. So hopefully, when 2025 uh, comes around, a new consensus will be emerging, just as happened in the late 40s. Mm -hmm. Remember, after World War I, mm -hmm. isolationism came back, especially in the 1930s with the Depression. But after the war, you got a bipartisan huge change. Former isolationists from the 1930s led the charge for uh, the U.S. having a more active role in resisting uh, Soviet communism. Is there a good analogy to be had on, on the response after World War I, you know, famously being punitive to Germany after World War II, famously investing in, um, you know, those that we conquered, Japan and others. Is that a situation that can apply here with regard to what the Middle East looks like um, after this, you know, particular conflict has been resolved? Are we investing enough? In that well, I region? think there was always sort of the hope, at least with uh, regard to Gaza, this is one of the reasons why the Israelis were not prepared for what happened, was they started to let uh, people from Gaza work in Israel itself. Standard of living started to improve. Talk about maybe Gaza could evolve into a Singapore of yeah, sorts that's a, in, in, in the Middle I've East. Heard. And uh, you look at the West Bank, highest standard of living of any non-oil Arabs, non-oil, mm -hmm. underline that highest per capita income, but it's not just bread alone that motivates people's behavior. And so I think in terms of the aftermath of this, hopefully forces, new forces will arise that'll say, uh, let's do what some other countries have done. And, uh, and also, we don't have very good advice we're offering right now on how to make an economy move ahead. Mm. Uh, we did after World War II uh, have a stable uh, monetary system reducing trade barriers, which made the 30s such a horror show, and we saw the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully uh, Egypt may uh, do make some real economic reforms, and maybe uh, Jordan and uh, others that uh, can show other states uh, there is a way to uh, move ahead. Uh, the raw material is there. I mean, Egypt was the first one of the first civilizations. Yeah. You know, I, I, I want to pivot back to the U.S., but I feel I'd be remiss not to mention China. I mean, China has tried to play a role in the region, you know, with Saudi Arabia and, and others. How much should we be thinking about China right now as we're focused on Europe, we're focused on the Middle East? Um, you know, China's there, but it's sort of seen to me a little bit as a one-dimensional character right now in this whole debate. Well, China saw an opening thanks to our mistakes with the Saudis. And uh, that's one reason why oil prices spiked. Uh, the regime there felt no uh, compassion for the Biden administration's predicament of waging war against fossil fuels here at home. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, yeah, China was, was poking in. But the impact on China is going to be 
Does it look like the West, as I, well, that is Europe, and especially the United States, is getting its act together? One of the things that uh, is really hangs over all of this is lack of credibility. Mm. China, Russia, Tehran, North Korea, and others see the U.S. as a declining power, just as uh, the Soviets and others thought in the 1970s. And uh, can the U.S. get its uh, stuff together? And so that's why, again, what we do in the next couple of years is going to be critical. It's the trend line that counts. It's what counted in the 80s. Looked like we were coming back. And uh, that's ultimately led to victory in the Cold War. Yep. So in terms of China, even though it's much stronger in numerous ways than the Soviet Union ever was, if China sees that the U.S. is starting to play to its strengths again, that uh, gives them a little bit of pause, but also encourages its neighbors that uh, they won't have to be doing, uh, uh, making, uh, do kowtowing and uh, making uh, tribute payments uh, to Beijing as they had to do in days of old. Well, let's or Nanking, whatever the let's talk about was. the um, the trend lines. You know, here in the U.S., I mean, you've uh, you and I have discussed in the past, and you've you've certainly <coughs> said that you do not believe it will be a Biden versus Trump election. Do you still think that to be the case, given what we're seeing in the polls? Well, whenever there's an, uh, an international crisis, uh, people rally around the president. Mm -hmm. uh, John Kennedy famously was, was stunned that after the absolute disaster of the Bay of Pigs, uh, that his popularity soared. Uh, people rally around the flag immediately mm -hmm. after a crisis. But as George W. Bush can tell you, uh, that doesn't always last very long. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that is a momentary thing, a healthy thing, uh, you don't want division when uh, uh, the world is in trouble, uh, hot war trouble. So, uh, but that's not going to save, I don't think, uh, President Biden. I'll stick to my uh, prediction that uh, next year at some point, probably in the spring, he'll do what Lyndon Johnson did back in 1968 when an incumbent president decides he's not going to actually wage a campaign for re-election. And, and um do you have predictions for who will, who is the best, um, what's the best ticket to replace him? Well, you can uh, do all kinds of speculation, but I think one of the things that we should have learned and certainly has hit me in the past 20 years in this, this extraordinary century is humility about the astonishing things that have unfolded that no one could have conceived could happen. And uh, whether it's uh, political, whether it's economic, whether it's uh, what happened on 9-11, mm. uh, the economic crisis of 08, 09, the turbulence we had, the shutdowns we had in 2020, 2021, and uh, what we see unfolding today. So uh, yes, you can say uh, certain things look uh, inevitable, but by golly, but things, uh, change. Uh, well, think things change, and as somebody said, the consensus is always wrong. <laughs> so, well, well, let's take one thing that has happened, which is Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who was basically going after um, as, as an alternative to Biden, is now running as an independent. Um, how does that impact the race? I think you're going to see several people or forces. Uh, we already see that unfolding, Joe Lieberman and others, mm -hmm. uh, on a, a third party. No labels, yeah. Uh, a third party effort. And that reflects deep dissatisfaction with uh, what the two parties have been uh, offering up. And so uh, there will be. Whether they get any traction uh, remains to be seen, but it certainly gives people an outlet right now to uh, register their displeasure. And what usually happens in American politics is that one of the two major parties eventually absorbs the uh, protest movements that uh, rise up as third parties. But you will see third parties, and uh, you will see them uh, gather some strength just because people don't believe they've been well served by what's been served up, you might say. Well, <laughs> RFK Jr. seems to be coming at a cost right now to the Biden administration. When you, is that surprising to you? or uh, No, because uh, uh, people this way, they could uh, think they could vote for a, a protest about what they think of the huge abuses, especially happened during COVID, uh, without going to uh, the Republicans. Uh, so what the Republicans end up doing uh, is going to have enormous impact on uh, third parties. 
But uh, even in 1920, going back then, when uh, the Republicans won a huge landslide, the biggest in American history up to that point, mm -hmm. you still had a very active third party, a socialist who was a hero of uh, Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. a fellow named Eugene Debs, ran for president from a penitentiary cell in Atlanta. He was arrested during World War I for opposing it, and uh, he got over a million votes, 4% of the vote. So, uh, yes, there will be a third party. Power of the people. Um, so <coughs> at this juncture, let's let's end with the, the GOP race because so much discussion has been about the domestic economy and some of these, you know, very real economic issues that you've talked about. Is this now going to pivot more to foreign policy being an issue, or do you still think that we really have to focus on what's happening at home? Uh, the home is the base because if you have a strong home base, as we saw in the 1980s, and by contrast in the 70s and the 1930s, if you have a strong home base, you can have a strong, credible foreign policy, mm -hmm. much better for the world. In the 70s, when we were weak, we couldn't cope with inflation, everything was going wrong, it seemed. Uh, bad things happen in the world. Obviously, the same thing happened in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, uh, that's why I'm interested in what the candidates put forward in terms of, as Reagan did in 1979, 1980, how do you propose getting this country moving forward again? And uh, so far, uh, the ones who are challenging Trump haven't forcefully done that in a way that has captured people's imaginations, that you can put on a bumper sticker, like tax cuts or Anybody something like that. Anybody capturing your imagination, at least starting to a little bit of that slate? Uh, uh, I've been... Uh, impressed uh, that uh, what Nikki Haley and uh, Vice President Pence have done on foreign policy. Uh, we cannot go back to isolationism and uh, think that you can appease Putin by uh, uh, dividing up Ukraine. Uh, we divided up Korea and that uh, didn't work out very well in terms of uh, what the North has ended up doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I, I'm impressed with those. Even though his candidacy is flaming out, Vivek Ramaswamy uh, at least uh, understands there's a problem at the Federal Reserve and has said some nice things, things about the flat tax. Mm -hmm. But uh, they have to uh, make a, a standout case. And if they do, I think uh, people will respond. Just as Ross Perot, total outsider in 1992, looking under the hood and that kind of thing, fixing things, uh, tapped. And yeah. uh, he and made shape some helped mistakes. Shape the agenda too. And, uh, uh, but he still ended up uh, getting 19% of the popular vote. So uh, the mood is there. Uh, people are just waiting. What is going to be forcefully put and credibly put on the table? And so, so far, that hasn't happened yet. I don't want to do any predictions on Donald Trump, but any comments on you know how he's running the campaign so far? I mean, again, you could well, fit there, a week's there, worth there, of there conversation was, uh, there. Interesting story, I think it was in the New York Times, that uh, even though Trump is not doing the traditional thing of going to every diner in Iowa, uh, what his people have done on uh, the state level is try to uh, write the rules in a way that favors him. Uh, they cite the example of Nevada, where uh, Governor DeSantis has virtually been frozen out of the state because they changed the rules on PACs. Mm. California. Usually uh, the de delegates are divided by how well you do in congressional districts. But they just passed a rule, the pushing of the Trump people, that if you get 50 percent, you get the entire delegation, all 100 percent. So uh, he's been working on that uh, behind the scenes. But who knows how things are going to play out legally. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, I think, put it very well in the midst of the Civil War. He said, I must confess events have controlled me more than I've controlled events. So things don't stay the same. And uh, things can happen that upend you uh, or enhance you in a way you just cannot predict. Truer words never spoken. I look forward to continuing the conversation, Steve. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Diane. Appreciate it.